Hi, Sh Shantana. Shantana, hello. I'm, I'll just go ahead. I think you're the first person here, and I'm going to go ahead and just introduce myself. I'm Mary Knight, and I uh, am a survivor of extreme child abuse, including ritual abuse and also um, familial sex trafficking. I was trafficked by my parents. I'll also introduce myself by saying I really have a good life now, and um, I'm um, I'm just really ha happy in um, just in my everyday life. Um, not to say that there aren't times that um, that I'm triggered or that my life is affected by my childhood. Oh, uh, thank you all so much for coming. And um, I'm glad to answer any questions you have about me. Um, and I'm uh, oh here. I'm hearing, seeing comments. Thanks for taking the time to spread awareness. Um, I loved your documentary. Thanks for sharing your story. Okay, thank you for all your comments. Do you have any questions for me? After, some of you have seen the documentary. Do you have any questions that you want me to answer about it? I'll just keep talking. Uh, so I decided to make the documentary um, as a bit of a long story, but I was um, planning to either make, uh, I was looking into making a personal documentary and I was also looking into um, writing a memoir. And so I, um, I applied to, I was in documentary class. Um, I, I don't have a degree in film, but I've taken a few film classes. So I was taking a documentary class and I was told like, um, it's not enough. You, you can't really make a childhood. You can't really make a documentary about something that ha only something that happened in the past. You need something happening now. And um, maybe my advocacy work or something, but I, my idea of just making it all about my childhood um, would not follow the form of a, of an interesting documentary. So then I uh, also applied to a um, MFA program, Master of Fine Arts, um, and I was applying to it as a part-time program, but um, I wrote about something that happened in my childhood and they accepted me. I actually have a letter accepting me and then I got another letter saying, we can't accept that essay because Basically, it sounded like because I can't prove it, because I didn't have newspaper articles or I didn't have police records while well, my parents were never apprehended. And um, so it felt like they were saying, I don't believe you. And that's how I came up with the idea of making a documentary, Am I Crazy? My Journey to Determine If My Memories Are True. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so how did you overcome and move on to a happy life in adulthood? That's such a good question. I, I, am, I am now writing my memoir. I'm writing essays. So uh, feel free to um, contact me. And uh, the moderator could put my email address up. And I can um, tell you, I, I have a long list of how I healed. It's a very long list. And it's, you know, it takes a long time and a lot of effort to heal. But I, um, I, still do things like meditate. I do yoga a lot. I just cross my legs in a yoga sitting position. Um, I, I take antidepressants. Um, and I don't think for me, I think that was needed. Um, I used to take a higher dose and now it's a low dose, but, um, I still seem to need that. I get, get counseling. I got counts. Um, I got counseling. Um, and there you can see my, um, my email address Mary Knight happy at yahoo.com or you can go to my um, my website my website has a list of how I healed I have a longer list also um, but on my website it's it's a rather lengthy list of things I did to help to um, heal um, wow there's lots of you here I I'm so glad you know I felt so lonely as a survivor of ritualistic abuse because, you know, people don't talk about it. And, um, 
and and I know what I mean. And then I talked to another survivor and things that happened to me that were so bizarre. And she's like, oh yeah, um, I know a number of people. Um, and I don't know, could you let me know? I, I don't want to say anything too triggering for anyone. Um, so, so I know a little bit about what level I should talk about. Um, let me know, just put in the chat it's okay or, or be really careful or something like that. Oh, here's someone say, you are not alone. We don't talk because we haven't been believed for so long. Yes. Um, oh, and what should someone do or say to help someone that has suffered abuse? That question, I'll go, I, I tell people, I'm sorry that happened to you. I've heard one survivor who didn't like people to say that, but every other survivor I've talked to really likes someone just to say, I'm really sorry that happened to you. And, and then, you know, say, I believe you and I'm willing to listen. So listening to another person, one of my best experiences with a minister was a minister who he wasn't very good at, um, his sermons were not that interesting and he ended up, being asked to leave eventually just because he did he wasn't a dynamic speaker. But when I came in and told him about my childhood, he listened to me for one hour and he said very little and he kept apologizing. I just know nothing about this. And and um but he he just listened and it's so healing to have someone listen. Um I want to address someone said something about the doctor the doctor had me screaming <laughs> i could not believe what he was saying yeah in in this um extended version of my documentary am i crazy my journey to determine if my memories are true it is um i have footage of leaders from the false memory syndrome foundation who um say some really odd things and one of those things, because I, I read, um, one of the things that people say is, oh, you have false memories and you've just listened to your counselor and your counselor has brainwashed you, which really, that would be hard for a counselor to do. And what would the motivation be? But, but anyway, um, I know that's not true of me, but, and then they also talk about, oh, you read a book, you read Courage to Heal, and that's why you have these memories. So I um, took, a month, a month, actually it was six weeks, where all I read was things published by the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. And I thought, you know, if, if they say this is why I have the memories, then maybe I'll quit having the memories if I read all their publications and everything. So in it, it was something real disturbing was it seemed like some of the books were diminishing the seriousness of child abuse. And even saying that if it happened when you were really young, it wouldn't hurt you. So I talked to a board member and I asked him that, and it was amazing the things he said on camera. Um, and he came up later, I thought I had come up with this example because it's such an extreme example, but no, he's the one who said it. He said, no matter what happens to a child under the age of three, they won't remember it, and so it won't affect them. And he gave the example of a two-year-old witnessing the murder of his parents, which is so ridiculous. That would be like you could just go pick up a two-year-old and, and take care of him, and they would never notice they were missing their parents. Anyone who's babysat for a two-year-old knows that's not true. Um, I mean, this is just common sense that any parent, any person would have. It also diminishes the... Um, importance of the early year of parenting during the early years and um it, it was just astounding that he would say that um so i'm you know i'm glad i have that in my expanded version um and um and then this is the first time i've had the founder of the false memory syndrome foundation um have included the footage of her um i I didn't include it before because I had this editor that I later found out his sister had been abused by their father and he didn't believe his sister. 
And first he just identified himself as someone who had been abused by his um, family physician. He himself had been abused. And so anyway, he gave me bad advice. He said that I shouldn't have two mother and daughter. So he wanted me to not have Eleanor and her daughter. Eleanor is the one who said child sexual abuse is much to do about nothing. And a family shouldn't, a family should stay together even if there was child sexual touch um, and that the child should stop sex abuse. I mean, just ridiculous things. So I kept her in, but now I have both of them in and I think it works well. Uh, was there something you filmed that you were not sure to include in your documentary? Oh, so many things. I have so much more footage. Um, I have some footage which um, I need to find a place to put, but it's of another person who is describes himself as middle of the road. And he um, neither believed nor did not believe. He asked these questions that were kind of nonsensical, but he asked, you know, how sure am I? And I said, well, I'm as sure that my memories are true as I am that God exists. And so then he asked me percentage-wise, how much do I believe in God, which is a, I mean, I don't know. It's not, I asked a few people after that. It wasn't a real popular question, but anyway. But I would say, you know, I, I totally believe in God. Um, and that's just my personal, I, I want to say, if some of you do not believe in God, that's fine. I'm not trying to get you to uh, have certain belief system. I think that survivors are very spiritual people, but we find our own way to be spiritual. And I do not think it's necessary to believe in a higher power. Um, but anyway, then I had someone who had acted in my first movie. I have a, a romantic comedy that has identical twin sisters in it. It's Sister Mary's Angel. It's on my website. And, um, but it has a backstory that they were abused as children by their father. And, um, but it, it's not, it's, it's, I tried to make it more, more comedy than drama, but it's a combination of comedy and drama. Anyway, so one of the actresses had started um, doing production work. She started, you know, filming and everything. So she was, I hired her to like hire the camera people and that sort of thing. I paid her some and she paid them out of that money. So she was with me and I took footage of her and I before we went to see, his name is Dr. Jonathan Schooler, and um, who lives in Santa Barbara, and works as a professor in Santa Barbara, California, and, and this actress is in LA. So I interviewed her and told her, or it was not really an interview, it was me telling her about my abuse and she believed me. And then we went to see that psychologist, uh, professor, Dr. Jonathan Schooler, and afterwards I talked to her about how much she believed me. And she was like, oh, I would say 50-50. And it was, you know, I say, oh, well, that didn't bother me at all. But you can tell that it did bother me. It definitely did bother me. And I have footage of that. So I, I haven't put that in. Um, and, yeah, I have other footage, too. Um, I have... I tried to keep the sad parts fairly short, like at my mother's grave, at my, um, uh, yeah, I tried to keep the sad parts pretty short. I'm working on another film, Mothers of Molestation, a film about child abuse, and it uh, should be out by the end of the year. Um, so, yeah, so other films. And then, I don't know if uh, some of you maybe haven't seen my film on, Real, uh, real women, real stories. Um, that is uh, two minutes long, but it's it's really very um, intense, and it's um, it's it's called "Why My Mother Molested Me." Why my mother molested me. So it's. Um, but it's just two minutes long, but when you see it, you'll see it seems like more. 
Is there a part two? Um, well, um, mothers of molestation is kind of part true to in that the film is up. I was able to come to terms with my father during that film, but I realized after it was over, I still had not come to terms with my mother. And so um, Mothers of Molestation includes that. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people who discredit survivors, and sometimes it's, you know, they just, People don't want to believe it. I understand people not wanting to believe it. And then there's other people who just don't want to listen to it. Um, would you recommend a video about SRA that isn't exploitative? Um, I, I have no firsthand information about it, run, it runs in the government. I have no firsthand information about that. Um, and so what I do when I tell about abuse, and this is my policies, I do not, um, I don't tell about things unless I have firsthand information. And there's plenty of things that I do have firsthand information about. So, um, but that's not one of them uh, about government officials. Um, and is there another video? I, I tried to make my video as easy to watch as possible and I, I don't know, um, I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know other videos to recommend. Um, I do have children, they are grown. I'm proud of my adult sons and that's all I say about them. I, I, I just don't, I feel like it's their um, right to tell their own stories. And so I, I don't say anything about them publicly except for what I've already said in my film, which one thing I have put in my film is one reason I have hypnosis, really the main reason I have had hypnosis, rather than just waiting for the memories to come, was that I didn't know how to keep my children safe. I knew that there, was, um, there were perpetrators in one side of the family, but I didn't, I didn't know about the other side of the family. And because uh, my cousins who remember, I have five relatives who have memories similar to mine, they were all on one side of the family. And I didn't know which relatives I could have my kids around. So I remembered as quickly as possible and hypnosis was helpful to me. I'm not saying I recommend hypnosis, uh, but it, it was helpful to me. Uh, I just had six sessions and then the memories have come so quickly. I, I haven't needed some. I do have uh, EMDR sometimes. And um, I, um, it, and that's helpful. I mean, sometimes it's easier to remember something in a counselor's office. Okay, can you explain what SRA is and what do you think about people? Um, and what do you think about people who label SRA survivors as being mentally ill or crazy? Well, obviously I wouldn't want to be labeled as crazy. And um, I do have relatives who say that what I remembered is not true and who call me crazy. I've been called crazy. Uh, and, but, but what has been interesting about going public is now, you know, I like have over a thousand comments on, you know, about my film on YouTube and, I went through them not long ago and there to count which ones were negative and it was less than 10 out of a thousand there were less than 10 almost i mean the people who don't believe some of the people who don't believe me just have something to hide themselves and you know some of the people who don't believe me are people that i would not trust around a child no way would i trust around a child um and also i mean even if they're um Someone I knew from childhood, I would, wanted to go talk to him because I thought maybe he would remember some things because I remembered seeing him abused. And he got, he's a minister and he got his denomination to tell me I was disallowed from going to his church. I actually have a paper saying, a letter saying I, I'm not allowed to go to the church. Um, I will ex give my explanation, uh, my definition of, ritual abuse, and I don't normally say satanic myself because 
And that would imply I knew what was going in, I knew what was going on in the mind of my perpetrators, and I don't. I don't know if they were worshiping Satan. I don't know if they were trying to make child pornography. I know they made child pornography. So, um, but I don't know what their motive was. I mean, what's the motive for doing these really weird things to a child and then, and then um, taking footage of it? Um, so it could be child pornography. It could, it 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 could be. I I do think that child pornography sells for more if it includes religious symbols. I I talk to churches and 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 synagogues uh, and say, um, I think you need to be really careful who has a key to the building because um, these symbols, Jewish, Christian, whatever, um, the cross, the, the pulpit, um, you know, if someone can get in there and make child pornography, it will sell for more money. You need to be careful who has a key. Um, and, and I was abused in Sunday school classrooms. Um, I was abused on church property, um, outside on church property, like in the middle of the night. Okay. Um, okay, so I, this is in response to someone who talks about bringing half check and that things happened in Europe. I showed my film in um, I showed my film in Leipzig, Germany. I was I was um, invited, and uh, so I um, I was really nervous about talking about ritual abuse in in Germany. I mean, I was just nervous going to uh, since this. East Germany, um, not as many people know English. There was going to be a translator. I mean, there were lots of reasons to be nervous. But um, I wondered what they say about the ritualistic abuse. And it ended up a large portion of the audience, I would say at least 25% of the audience were survivors of ritualistic abuse. And some of them thought it was more prevalent under communist rule. Other people didn't think it was more common. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, some of the people were old enough like me that um, it was when uh, the communists ruled um, uh, East Germany. Do they know about what happens? Um, I'm not sure specifically that question. If you want to tell me more, uh, the people who call me crazy at, oh, I will say I have relatives who call me crazy. None of them have, like, this, this life stream is longer than they have ever talked to me. They have not been willing to talk to me for more than 10 minutes. Um, maybe one of them talked for 20 minutes. That is it. Oh, do my children know what happened? Um, again, and I'm, I'm really sorry because this is the one thing I won't talk about, but I just won't talk about anything about my children except for that they're wonderful adults. Um, and um, and they are doing well, and um, and that they do want their privacy respected. Um, oh, Netflix should do a documentary on me. Oh yeah, well we'll see. <laughs> um, one thing I like um, about making my own documentary is that I I have it. Um, I I have control over it, and. You know, I edited it myself. I really didn't want to edit it myself because it's a lot of work to edit. But editors have a lot of power. And I just, I like being my own editor. I like being able to decide what goes in and what doesn't. Um, someone said, apologies, no apology for asking about my sons. That's, that's fine. Um, oh, someone, thank you for speaking on this. Um, yeah, I, I can understand why someone would want to know how I've talked to my children. I just can't share that. Um, and um, I'm just reading some of the comments. Oh, I was trying to describe what I consider ritualistic abuse and how I because I needed to define it in my film and I define it as multiple 
multiple perpetrators and or multiple child victims, which is a very general way to describe it. Um, and then I say that often it involves sacred symbols. Um, but some people um, focus more on how organized it is, but it does have to be organized to have multiple, to have multiple perpetrators or multiple child victims. Um, under that definition, some people who would not otherwise call themselves satanic ritual abuse survivors do, you know, because I know someone whose um, father abused her and her siblings at the same time, and that would meet multiple child victims, but it wasn't any more organized than that that she knows of. Um, and uh, I also talked to someone, um, someone who saw my film actually on this uh, on YouTube on this YouTube channel she saw it and since then we have been talking on the phone and um, we talked about she doesn't consider herself a ritual abuse survivor but she definitely considers herself a torture survivor and I mean I think there's different I don't like it when the different terms set people apart I think it's important to um, be able to be sensitive to other survivors, even if they haven't, even if they don't use the same label. I will say it's been much easier on me when I describe myself as a familial, familial sex trafficking survivor because everyone knows sex trafficking happens, and it's hard to dispute the fact that parents or family members are often the ones who make the child available, which means that it's familial sex trafficking. Oh yeah, someone's gone to watch the two minute video. Yeah, glad if someone wants to do that, it is just two minutes long and then I'll be glad to talk about that. Someone does not remember her dreams, which um, what I started doing when, um, cause I didn't remember on my own, my um, aunt told my parents that she was abused as a child and that it, that it was generational and my parents just said well she's crazy we won't talk to her anymore but i went and talked to her and so then i really she told me i had witnessed abuse and i just knew it was true and i went to a counselor and she told me write down anything just get some spiral spiral notebooks and write down anything um it doesn't no matter how mundane, you know, like we had a swing set in our yard or something, just anything you remember about your childhood. And that's when I started remembering about my um, abuse. Um, like my first memory was, was not in a counselor's office, but um, I, um, I also started remembering my dreams and it was kind of fun you know it helped me to trust my subconscious because sometimes i i predicted the future which is sounds more daunting than it was but i um i was homeroom mom when my um well with both my sons and one of them was in i think he was in fourth grade and so i um i my dream was that i that there wouldn't be enough um that the pizza would be late and that I would forget the forks, which you could say, well, maybe I forgot the forks because I dreamed it, not the other way around, but there was no way to know the pizza would be late. There was just one pizza place in town and um, like three of the five employees had called in sick. And so everyone's pizza was like ours. I mean, all, a lot of people ordered pizza that day. So it was just like, you know, it, it kind of reminded me that, yeah, we do have subconscious thoughts that are very important and should not be minimized. Oh, here, lots of love from Poland. Oh, email me and I actually, well, it's my first documentary, but um, someone from Poland volunteered to put in Polish subtitles and that hasn't been used very much. So email me and I will send you that and then you can, you know, show it to whoever you want. Um, so yeah, I have, I have it in, I have the first one, not the expanded version, not yet anyway, but I have it in Spanish, German, Polish, and English closed caption. 
Okay. Um... Oh, DID, dissociative amnesia, basically is where you compartmentalize the really traumatic events to allow you to function. Yes, I agree with that. And um, I have not been diagnosed DID, but um, some counselors would probably diagnose me in that way. Um, and I certainly have a lot of friends who are DID, and I enjoy um, communicating with their younger parts. I enjoy play a lot. Um, I know I dissociate more than most people, uh, more than people who have not been traumatized. And um, and that's a controversial diagnosis. I do have some footage of Dr. Bessel Vanderkoek saying, in no uncertain certain terms, DID exists. And that's something I, I haven't gotten out there. Um, but um, it just take a little editing to put that together. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, that's another way to dis discount survivors because survivors of ritualistic abuse, at least 50% of us are DID. So then if you say DID doesn't exist and we're not going to do therapy for people with DID, it makes it, you know, impossible to, um, to get well. Um, Yeah, it was um, questioning my memories was, yes, I agree, it's very inappropriate. And and what Dr. Elizabeth Loftus did was, I mean, for her to say, well, I don't know if it really happened because I haven't talked to your relatives with similar memories. But she asked me how I know it happened and that's how I know it happened. She didn't have to talk to them for me to know. Um, Yeah, she so rubbed me the wrong way. Yes, that's probably about Eleanor or Dr. Loftus or both. There are many male survivors. I, uh, there are, there are so many male survivors. I do, I know a survivor who's, um, I think would be willing to be in contact with people. He gets help from a couple of different male survivor organizations and, um, he is a ritual abuse survivor. So if you contact me, I can ask him if he's willing to um, be in contact. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there's two different survivor, survivor organizations for men that I think are especially good. You are not alone. Yes, and none of us are alone. I think there's a lot of survivors among us today. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I already talked some about Dr. Vanderkoek and the babies under two years old. I don't know if all of you were on when I did, but. That's just bizarre for someone to think that abuse of a young child doesn't affect them. I used to do adoption work. I'm I'm a clinical I'm I'm going back to social work, so I guess I could say I'm a clinical social worker, and um, I'm um, can do play therapy with children. But I used to do adoption work, placed over 100 kids, and it's very obvious if a child's been traumatized, you know. Um, a one or two year old or a six month old. I mean, they don't, they just don't act the same as they don't interact the same. They're so different than a child who has not been abused. Why were a target for SRA? Um, there's more to that question. Why were you a target? Why was I a target? Um, well, I think anyone who goes public about um, satanic ritual abuse is just, it's unfortunate. And I'm going public because I feel comfortable doing so now, but it's, it, we're so discounted. And um, I don't feel like a target. I just feel like one of the people who has gone public. Um, yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I have, I have talked to someone who was from Chile and has firsthand information of the abuse and adoption, the um, really kidnapping of children and putting them in 
adoptive homes according to someone's political beliefs. It's just bizarre. My 10th generation direct ancestor was named Loftus, and I think my family has connections with the Oregon City Followers of Christ cult. Yeah, um, uh, but Loftus isn't, like I know an actor whose last name is Loftus, and he's a nice guy. So um, that doesn't always mean something else. Um, my maiden name was Ramsey, and my um, after my mother died, my father dated a woman who worked for John Bonet's father. So now I've kind of wondered, but I, I haven't found any, you know, biological connection. But um, I do, my personal belief is John Bonet experienced some of the same kinds of abuse I experienced. Um, oh, yeah. Someone said, I don't have multiple personalities, even though I have dissociative amnesia yeah definitely yeah and i would say i have disassociative amnesia because otherwise i would have remembered before i was 37 so yeah that's how i would consider myself too and then i have friends who are um uh, we, it used to be called multiple personalities and i i remembered in 1993 i'd go to conferences in the late 90s and i'd have friends who would uh be in younger personalities and I would enjoy playing with them. Um, we, you know, play with dolls and paper dolls. And I brought toys each time and I had this little, they let me have this little room where we could, um, at the comp, at the hotel where we could just play, you know, the night before. And I think it helped me um, be, uh, I mean, I just liked it and other people did too. Um, okay, you said earlier survivors are spiritual. I agree, but how did you recover spiritual trust? That's a good question. Um, oh, and so um, I, I think for me it wasn't as hard to... Um, it wasn't as hard to um, recover spiritually because I, I had some um, some communication with God, some like direct communication with God from the well, when I was six. I don't know if it was a near death experience because I was very abused. It could have been, and I don't know if it was. Um, but anyway, it seemed like God just when no one, when I felt so unloved and just wanted to die um, and had been very injured, um, it felt like, uh, it felt like God was just, you know, shining on me, just, just, um, so when I recovered my memories, I also recovered that one, and I think that made it easier. Um, there are times I've had to leave church. I, I know that Part of my abuse included candles, and I think it was a way to desecrate uh, or make it hard for me to go to church. I grew up in the Church of Christ, which is very conservative and doesn't, um, you know, wouldn't have candles. It just would not happen. I'm talking to Long Soul System. Oh, that's a neat name. Um, but um, I remember going to a Methodist church because I'd left the Church of Christ, went to a more liberal church, and they had candles, and it's like, they desecrated that. They tried to desecrate that for me. But I still, um, but they tried to desecrate communion, too, and I still love communion. So, um, so yeah, they, they didn't do it. But the healing from that is really difficult, and that's one thing. I've written a, an essay, which if any of you want, if any of you go to church or synagogue or, um, well, yeah, any um religious organization, I'd love for you to see it because I have ideas on how to, um, on safety policies that are not being used. It goes beyond the usual do a background check and it goes beyond the usual um, uh, have two, two adults in the room with the child or something. There's more we can do. And, um, and I make the point that it's so hard to, you know, you need a safe place, and 
um, my safe place was school. Um, nothing bad happened to me at school, but, um, you know, we want our, any reasonable person wants children to be safe at their, um, place of worship. Um, okay. Oh, little Mayo. I don't know if I'm saying names right. Moldy Crouton. That's a cool name. Um, I thank you for your comment. Um, thank all of you. I mean, I, I, uh, these are such good comments. Hey, I'm looking to see some new comments. Be proud to be a survivor. I love that comment. Okay. From Chris, Kristen. Um, yeah, I was not safe at school. I didn't know others. It's so bad when um, that's um, Christina. That's so sad. Jane, oh, thank you for the nice comment. Um, oh, uh, oh, Christina, yeah, that's sad. Something happened to you at church. Um, yeah, uh, satanic ritual, SRA is satanic, it stands for satanic ritual abuse. Oh, yeah, so. Someone has asked again, satanic ritual abuse. And um, I used to believe in Satan, and I don't. I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't, but I just don't. And when I used to believe in Satan, I had a counselor who didn't believe in Satan. I said, well, how can you believe me with my satanic ritual abuse memories? And she said, well, she believed that there were people who organized themselves um, in order to do evil things, evil things to children. And so she didn't feel like she had to believe in Satan. And, and I, I don't uh, believe in Satan now, but um, I do know that children are very abused. Um, so I usually say ritualistic abuse, although I'm fine with uh, someone calling me a survivor of satanic ritual abuse. I feel God kept me alive. Christina, yes, I, that, that's how I feel too. How did you get involved with people that were performing SRA on you from Bethany? Um, well, they were my parents. They were my grandparents. They were um, really all, all my relatives. I, um, I, I was just really basically born into it. Um, so it, it was generational. And some people say, you know, they really want the bloodline, and I, uh, I, I, I don't have firsthand information except for I will say the abuse went back. My aunt thinks it went back to her great grandparents, which would be my great great grandparents. So she thinks it went back that far. Thanks for your comment, Anne. Yes, I, I made this film so it would help others. I mean, that was my whole motivation. Oh, how did I feel talking to Goldstein, Loftus, and Dr. Pancras? I hated it. <laughs> I mean, I really did not like it. I look at that footage and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I did that. I was, um, it was really difficult. It was difficult and if there's other survivors who want to make a film, I encourage you to have a support person on set. I just kept trying. I kept thinking, well, surely the person who's taking the cinematography or surely someone there. I've had, I've really only had one real support person on set. Last time I was on set, because I, you know, I'm the producer too. And so I had to negotiate with the camera people because, you know, it's a, uh, 
a film costs a lot of money and yet I had to pay people less than their usual fees in order to even be able to afford it. So they were fussing about when everyone was going to take lunch and no one asked me, Mary, have you gotten to have lunch? And I mean, I'm talking about these really difficult things. So I would say, um, I, I would say that, um, it was horrible. It was, it was so hard. When I interviewed Dr. Loftus, I went, she is in Southern California, Irvine, California. And I flew my, um, my most expensive and really, uh, I, the camera person I used used to, he, he was director of photography the first year of Curb Your Enthusiasm. I mean, he's good. And he flew out there with me. I had negotiated fee with him. And we made it just a real long day trip so we wouldn't have the hotel expense. He's a happily married man, and he's, um, uh, and I'm very happily married myself, but um, he's a father. He's a good father, a good husband, good person. But he didn't totally believe me. He thought Loftus had some good points. I'm like, what? And then I told him, I talked to him recently. I said, did I misunderstand or did, did you, what did you think of Loftus? And she said, well, she kind of had an agenda, but she had some good points. I said, people who watch my film, you know, they, they hate Loftus. And he said, oh, well, that's probably because of how you edited it. I said, no, it's not because of how I edited it. It's because of what she said. She said horrible things. And he, and he just didn't pick up on it. And this was my, you know, person I, um, and it was a day trip, but it was, and on the way home, when we got on the plane on the way home, I said, uh, let's just sit separately. I, I mean, it wasn't mad at him exactly, but it was just like, he was not supported at all. He was like the opposite. And um, and it was a hard shoot too, because I'd hired someone off Craigslist there who had lied to me about all his credentials. And so sorry, I hired him and started to ask for, him. oh, he had to have cash, which he'd never said that before. So I had to give him cash before he'd give me the footage. So we'd had this, you know, so... Bradley, the cinematographer I liked, you know, he, he was nice to me and everything, but, um, and helped me figure out how to get a lift back because this other person was supposed to drive this back to the airport. And, you know, he was really nice, nice person, good person, but he just didn't get it. And I kept having people like him on set who were just like, yeah, not either. Um, Okay, so yes, it was hard. It was really hard. I would not want to do that again. Um, it, uh, the other thing that was hard was Loftus only had two hours and I never knew when she was gonna say, this is it, I won't talk to you anymore. And so I had to, I asked her some questions at one point. She said, this seems very argumentative. And I didn't even, I did not include that in, um, there's more that I could have included about Loftus. She, um, uh, she, um, uh, there were ethic, ethics complaints against her. I, I won't go into more, but um, uh, I do have a friend who just is finishing a book on the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, and it has more details about that. So email me if, and let me know if you want on the list for that. It will be coming out very soon. Um, yeah, I, when I'm editing footage, I'm like, I'm glad I don't have to do any more of that, and I, I'm not going to sit across from people like that anymore. Um, and yeah, um, Dr. Vanderkoop was, you know, I love what he said, but he didn't have much time. He, I think that was a 45 minute interview and I just had to get a lot done in a short amount of time. And so that was, um, you know, that was hard in a different way, but I'm just so thankful he let me use the footage and oh, I'm so thankful. Okay. NAMI and family courts. Oh yeah, I hadn't heard, I'd never heard anything about NAMI before. I did show my film at the NAMI chapter here and I had a good experience doing so. Um, oh, thank you. Someone, uh, Sarah, you still did a great job talking to people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, All the evil help us improve our strength and inner light. So difficult process, but possible. Thank you to be here with us. Thank you. Um, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Piera. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced it, but thank you for the comment. 
Allison. Um, the family court employed these mental health experts too. Yes, absolutely. I know someone who almost lost custody. Well, I used to do um, custody evaluations. I used to do parenting time evaluations, or they're called they're called different things in different states. Some um, it's the kind of work a guardian ad litem does, DAL. And I had a ritual abuse client, and I had not gone public about ritual abuse because I was afraid it, it would, um, the opposing attorney would discount me in court and effectively discount me in court. So I didn't let anyone in my professional community, um, uh, my practice didn't, not in the town where I lived, in uh, another town over, and I didn't let anyone know about my history. Um, and so then, um, I had this client and it looked like she might lose custody and she was such a good mom. I talked to the kindergarten teacher and she's like, her child is the best adjusted child in my class. And so I, I tried to find her. I, she'd been to counselors who believed her and I tried to find them and they were, you know, they were hesitant to say anything because um, again, you might want to, if you want more detail, you can read that book on false memory syndrome foundation, but there was a court case in the late nineties where, uh, a counselor was sued in criminal court. Um, like she could have been put in prison because she had done treatment, um, with someone with DID. And then that person later said, I didn't have DID and you, you talk me into these memories and they're not true. These ritual abuse memories. So um, that was at that time. But anyway, I was glad I had gotten the case because she might have lost custody. Um, and I did let the father have unsupervised visitation. Um, and I, I don't think he's an abuser. But um, unfortunately, the grandmother, who was a ritual abuser, I believe she was, she had gone to court already and gotten one week in a month overnight, which is really scary. Um, so. Um, there was anything I could do about it. I mean, my main concern was that the father would give access to the grandmother and the grandmother already had access. So it, it um, so anyway, they are, I ended up being in court for that and um, even testifying and, and she did, she, she got custody and her ex-husband got um, like, I don't know, two weekends a month or something. Um, if Satan, I, Tina, I just want to say if Satan is not real and people are made in the image of God and therefore should have his attributes, where else would evil come from? And who is it Satan's worship? Um, yeah, those are really good questions. And um, my answer to them used to be different than it is now. Um, I remember that it was really helpful to me that uh, my beliefs and I'm not saying that my beliefs are true. I'm just saying they're my beliefs. Um, I'm, I'm um, no longer conservative Christian. I'm, I no longer uh, believe the Bible is the one and only word of God. Um, and um, so I don't have those same beliefs. You will find though plenty, a lot of people in the SRA community who do believe in Satan and um what I think is my parents chose to be mean. I mean, um, there are some people who, there are some people who, in my view, it's just my view, blame Satan, but they don't blame their parents. They don't blame the actual perpetrators. And they say their parents were, um, you know, in this altered state and they didn't know what they were doing. I think, I mean, anyone can, why you were abused, that, that is a very personal question. Each person has to answer that, that themselves. But what is most comfortable to me is just saying, you know, my parents were so evil that I can't understand what was in their mind. And um, I, um, it, they did, they chose to do what they did. They chose to do what they did to me. Um, did they love me? No, I don't believe they did. Um, am I lovable? Yes. Did they love me? No. Um, and were they capable of? No, I don't think they were. And I do know the abuse was generational. And if you saw that two minute film I made 
why my mother molested me. It tells about the generational abuse that she was, that I have firsthand knowledge that she was sexually abused by her father. So in other words, abuse continued. And she was an adult woman and had me, had children and was still um, um, having sex with her father. I don't know a better term to use, but so um, I think for me, it's helped to hold my parents very responsible. Other people make other decisions about that that work for them. Um, that's not really a commentary on Satanism, though. Um, that's, I mean, that's a belief system. Like my husband is Jewish. His belief system is different than mine. Um, so I just, I really am very accepting of belief systems for as long as they cause people to be kind and not cruel. I'm very accepting of belief systems. And, and I have been involved with like Buddhist uh, retreats and other things. And that was a part of what got me away from uh, some of the beliefs that are uh, exclusively Christian beliefs. Um, I, I don't know, maybe there's other religious groups who believe in Satan. Uh, maybe I just don't know that much about it. Um, thank you for speaking about your experience. And oh yes, I've already, thank you for that comment, I think. Let me see new ones. I am lost and don't know what to believe. Oh, yeah, that's a really hard place to be, Erin. Um, just to not know what to believe. That's a really hard place to be. And this is something I did, which is what it brought to mind. But when I first remembered my abuse, I would really doubt myself. And I, it was after I you know, had memories and hypnosis. It was um, I very detailed memories and I still, I would doubt myself and I started, it, it was so hard on me that I started giving myself a limit. I could only doubt myself two days a week and then I could function because I wanted to function as a mother, a wife and um, just, and a professional. I, I was doing social work at the time. So um, I think it was Tuesdays and Thursdays and I just didn't allow myself to think on the other days, maybe this isn't true. Um, and that helped me um, to have that function, to be able to do that. Um, as a survivor, what, um, Sophie maybe, what do you think about Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial? Do you think her loss is a setback for survivors like you? What is your take on it? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, um, I, I hope this isn't too offensive to people, but when I was doing some really hard, you know, editing some of my really hard stuff and hearing and just having to like listen to my own hypnosis tapes, I mean, just really hard stuff for me. And there was something else going on too. I can't remember what it was, but I would... I would watch, oh, oh, it was, oh, yeah, it was when the children were killed. It was the Texas shooting of the children. And I tried to stay away from the news, and and I went to yoga class and online, and the teacher the whole time talked about grief and these children, and I'm like, I had tried to stay away from the news. So I wouldn't much. So I left yoga class and, and found out a little bit about the horrible situation with those children being killed, uh, murdered. And so then I found some Johnny Depp stuff and I just started watching it. And my take on Johnny Depp and Amber Heard is they have both been abusive to each other, and that neither of them are credible. And that it was like, it was like something I could watch that how much harm can be done that's not already I mean, if Johnny Depp wanted people to believe he's sober, then why not actually get sober um, and uh, follow what, um, what um, oh, the famous singer, he said, who had given him advice. Well, I know that singer did everything you're supposed to do in AA, which does not include drinking now and then um, or drugging. So anyway, I... I Kind of, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, and I hope I didn't step on toes because I know people have real strong opinions. But no, I don't think it's setback survivors like me. Um, I, I think 
that, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think it did. At first I did because that reminded me Amber's, Amber Heard's, testimony and the questions remind me of my first marriage, which was uh, verbally abusive. But later, when it seemed to me like she had lied, I mean, yeah, uh, that's just my opinion. Okay, we'll talk about something else. Other questions? Um, do you struggle with addiction as an adult, Chelsea? Uh, um, and yeah, well, I do, it's not the addiction you may be thinking of, but so many survivors are addicts. And um, and I do recommend AA um, or NA, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, AA Alcoholics Anonymous. I think the 12 step groups are really helpful. The group that helps me is Al-Anon, which is for friends and families of alcoholics. And really everyone, you know, in the United States, um, everyone all over the world, if you don't have a friend or a relative who is an alcoholic, I would just say that's very rare. Almost everyone knows someone who's an alcoholic. And so that means Al-Anon is available to everyone. And it's um, free. It's a great support group. And my addiction was to pleasing people. My addiction was to fixing other people's problems. And I still, um, uh, I, I went back to Al-Anon not long ago. And, um, and now sometimes other sport groups help me more. But um, that addiction to trying to help people, um, I really want to help people. I mean, that's why I'm making the film. This is my life's work. But it's not my addiction. Um, and, but in, in personal relationships, sometimes I try to, you know, give advice to someone who hasn't asked for advice. And that is an addiction. It's a different kind of addiction. My uh, feelings uh, towards someone who's an alcoholic is that I have an addiction to. It's just a different one. Um, or um, sex addiction. I, I know someone who's a survivor of um, satanic ritual abuse, and she's a sex addiction therapist. And um, I don't know if I, I think she's full, and I don't know that she does work online, but um, it, it is really hard to find counselors, especially with the pandemic. There's uh, such a need for counselors. That's why I'm going back and doing um, counseling with children now. Um, yes, Christina said a uh, um, uh, pediatrician drugged her. I was drugged. I, I'm sure I, I, there I, I have memories where I just black, goes to black, and I know I was drugged. I'm going to get myself a drink of water. I will be back in... 10 seconds. Oh. Good, I had one on the table. I am happy to be here, Miriam. I am happy you are here. Okay, does someone who's already asked a question that I didn't answer yet, could you put it back in chat so I can answer it now? Um, and I will answer Aaron's question. Do I remember capes rituals performed incantations? Um, oh, what if you remember those? Okay. I um, different. You know, I, I'm not saying there weren't capes or anything. My aunt thought that they had robes and. You know, I have memories that seem to be KKK, but I don't remember um, those things. Um, but they, you know what? I, uh, the rituals are different, you know, and and um, I don't have one thing. I don't. I don't like Halloween's not upsetting to me. It kind of seems like my parents abused me in atypical ways, and that way. I wouldn't identify as an SRA survivor. I mean, I said so much that this isn't about believing in Satan or not. I mean, when I believed in Satan, I, I still thought that they were, um, they were, they did a lot to hide their tracks. They did so much. They were very intelligent. Um, and also they had a medical doctor who was a friend who, and that's who I went to when I had bladder infections or when, 
I had um, hard to explain bruises and scars. Um, so, oh yeah, I um, Aaron saying I don't have scars or particular signs. I don't have scars either. I have one scar here. It's like two stitches, and it's where that doctor I mentioned um, I had fallen. And I really, what I remember is I'd fallen roller skating. Why I was taken to him instead of to um, group health, which was um, through Boeing, which was free for my parents. I don't know. But anyway, um, well, maybe I do know because I, I believe I was drugged and, um, and, and molested by him. And my father was present. Um, Yeah, I, um, again, Aaron, my aunt does have flashbacks of people in capes. And I don't know why I don't. Uh, what I remember is, um, uh, what I remember is just, I, I remember a lot of nudity, frankly, uh, as far as how people were dressed. Uh, uh, you know, that's just, thank you so much to the person who put something on screen about me being brave. Thank you. And I, I'm sorry I didn't catch the name, but thank you so much. This this feels so good. I was nervous about this. I've never done a chat like this before. Um, yeah, Freemasons. Yes, I have heard of cult abuse and Freemasons. Oh, robes instead of capes. Oh, okay. Aaron, you're from you're French, cool. Oh, my parents were in false memory. So yeah, my I got a letter from my mom that sounds like she was in the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. And um, uh, um, Lynn Crook, who's in my film, she uh, who's the one writing the book, she actually saw a TV show uh, that had um, FMSF meeting in it, and she saw her parents in on screen. Oh, thank you. I just want to say you are amazing and so very brave. Thank you so much, KMB. Thank you. Yeah, abuse on trains. Yeah, my memories were okay. Oh, oh, Aaron says not false memory, but Freemasonry. Oh, yes, I have heard. Yeah, I've heard um, of the Masons, um, although I don't have firsthand knowledge of it. Oh, thank. P.S. Thank you so much for speaking about SRA. Yes, thank you all for being here. I do think it's really important because, um, you know, we're they've silenced us by being so negative about us. Do you encourage survivors to name names? I have uh, na named some names. My, although um, it's, I've talked to my entertainment attorney. The fact that my parents are dead allows me to like show their tombstones and stuff and um, to name them um, David L. Ramsey and Mary Ann Ramsey. Um, and then my um, mother's maiden name was Park. Um, but, um, I don't see, I don't have, uh, there aren't people who are real famous. I, when I talk about the doctor, I just say Dr. D instead of his, um, real name, but he's also deceased. And, um, why haven't these perpetrators been caught? Very good question. South facing, very good question. Um, I, uh, I tried to report. I tried to report to police. I tried to report to Child Protective Services. Um, and I just wouldn't be listened to. And really, it's laws need to be changed so recovered memories are accepted as proof in court. Um, because, you know, otherwise, people just need to, perpetrators just need to abuse children so much that the children can't remember. And um, that's a part of the problem. A statute of limitations are being lifted in some states, which is really helpful. Um, 
I, um, but in, I live in Washington state and, um, it's, you know, statute of limitations would help me because they're all recovered memories and I don't have my relatives with similar memories. I have recovered memories too. So that doesn't help, um, in Washington state. And so, yeah, I'm in favor of laws being changed. Um, it's just so hard on a survivor to know their perpetrator is still out there. And most perpetrators do continue to abuse children. Um, I know my, my grandfather, I mean, he died when I was six and he raped me when I was five. Uh, I, last time I saw my grandfather, he raped me. Um, and, um, yeah, okay. We have a question. Why is Loftus, um, I'll go back to that just for a minute, but I'm going to talk about Weinstein, uh, Loftus working for Weinstein and other perpetrators. I'll just finish out what I was saying about why they're not, um, why the perpetrators are not caught. Part of it is it's organized. It's hard to catch people when it's organized crime, and child pornography is always organized crime. And uh, part of it is not being believed. and Kenneth Lanning, who used to work for the FBI, wrote a report that um, that Pam Fry had asked me about because she said, oh, this report proves there's no such thing as satanic ritual abuse. And are you willing to read the report? I said, absolutely, I'll read the report. I read the report and it looked to me like it was saying that the kind of abuse that happened to me really happens. Uh, Kenneth Lanning defined it Satanic ritual abuse is people who are organized in order to worship Satan who commit pedophilia, but they do it to worship Satan and not because they're pedophiles. Well, that's an interesting definition. Um, and he also discounts it because some satanic ritual abuse survivors say that it's so widespread. And so that's why I will never comment on how widespread it is. And... Um, I'm just being pragmatic. You know, I tell what happened to me. And then the other thing is, um, but then he goes on to say there are, um, I've forgotten what he called them, but like organized child pornography, organized um, groups that abuse children and trade children between them. And, and he really describes satanic ritual abuse. And said it happens. So he never, he didn't discount it. He, it's, it's a matter of definitions. Okay, Weinstein, Loftus did, Dr. Loftus was not very famous when I interviewed her. She was kind of a has-been. And then um, the, um, she did do some behind-the-scenes things with uh, O.J. Simpson, Simpson trial, but she didn't testify. So then I heard about her again with Cosby. Uh, Cosby's defense team hired her. And um, she didn't testify, but they hired her. And she was willing to, I mean, she stated publicly, oh, none of these women, um, it's too long ago, and none of them remember correctly. And Cosby doesn't remember correctly. So Cosby should walk. It's like Cosby shouldn't be apprehended because all these women, there were a lot of women who um, were supposedly not remembering correctly. And, um, and yeah, it was just ridiculous. So then the next thing was she, she testified for Weinstein, and she wasn't allowed to testify about traumatic memory because the court found her to not be an expert on traumatic memory, which good for them. She was limited in what she could say, but, um, you know, testing and for lot Weinstein, I mean, come on, you know? And, um, and that's one thing I've said something about the Johnny Depp trial, but I mean, Weinstein, I just don't see how any rational person could say that man's innocent. Um, and, and then um, other perpetrators, well, she's, yeah, she's hired by Glean Maxwell on, um, so she's, I, or she's already testified for Glean Maxwell. I think that's true. I know she was hired by them. Um, 
so yeah what do i think about that yeah i think it it's a commentary on who um loftus really is um you know you i'm really glad i have that footage of me asking her questions that she's never been asked before um and um yeah uh she doesn't i have found out um that she has seen the documentary. This is indirect. Um, it's a journalist who interviewed her and um, she does not like my documentary. Um, so here is someone from India. Thank you for sharing your story. You are brave, love from India. Thank you for, thank you for being here. Thank you for saying that. I'm not gonna try to pronounce your name. I, I had speech therapy until I was in third grade and I'm not very good with pronouncing things. And so I'm a little embarrassed to try to pronounce things, but thank you so much. Um, oh, uh, Chelsea's watching the documentary now. Thank you, Chelsea. I'm glad you are. Um, and oh, Sherry, bless, yeah, bless you also. Um, yeah, Cosby joked about some very inappropriate things. Oh, there was one on screen that I just, bless you, you are courageous. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, oh, good, uh, South Facing, I answered your question, that's good. Oh yeah, Hollywood connections. Um, yeah, that's you know one thing I think sometimes people say, well, satanic ritual abuse happens over here, but I kind of think I think it's all over. I mean, you just you have to keep your eyes open, and that's what I try to say to churches, and because um, there is a lot of um, this type of abuse um, that happens in churches. Um, and then I find like I was raised in the Church of Christ and I didn't trust people from the Church of Christ, but I've met someone who's now just really a friend who um, I have never met him, but he, uh, when his father, when his sister, uh, so Jim, his name's Jimmy Hinton, when Jimmy's sister reported child sexual abuse by their father, she recovered memories at age 19. He, um, he turned his father in and uh, the detective was so good. She questioned his father and, uh, and she was able to question his father, not because, because not because of the recovered memory report, but the fact that his father still has contact with kids, with uh, young children. He would, his father would babysit for and let them stay overnight. And so the detective was so good. And the Jimmy's father, admitted to 23 victims uh, during the interview. And Jimmy has spent, he spends his life helping churches be more safe. He's still, he's also a minister, a church Christ minister. So um, that's, um, it's just not limited to one church. You just, you know, have to be careful and trust your instincts wherever you are. Yeah, Erin saying she doesn't remember sacrifices. I I do remember sacrifices. I can't say they were actual human fetuses or actual I because I couldn't identify uh, a fetus. I mean I you know I at age four I couldn't identify a fetus from a distance. It could have been of a animal rather than a person. Where can we see the interview of Loftus talking about your documentary? Oh, email me and I'll find that. I can't remember. Philip is the reporter's name and he does have it posted on Facebook so it's publicly. Um, and you know, I think I will put it on my Facebook page as well. So I'm my Facebook, um, I don't know uh, if the moderator has my Facebook page, but if so, that's an easy place for me to post it um and um or email me and i'll i'll get that to you i i will 
yeah, I was kind of nervous about posting it, but now that it's been posted somewhere else, I can post it. Do you and other survivors like Kathy O'Brien or Annika Lucas go to each other for support? I I don't say the names of the people I go to for support. Um, I will say I have um, seen Annika Lucas's website and it looks really good. Um, and she is about uh, her book. She's, she wrote a book that just came out. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, I, so her book uh, is um, is very recent, and um, her name is A N N E. That's not how you spell her first name. A if someone knows it, put it in chat, and then you can find her website. Oh, thank you, Amanda. What a lovely lady you are. Thank you. Annika Lucas. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and so you can look that up and, and see her book. I haven't read it yet, but it's not didn't come out until this weekend. Um, MK Ultra is something I have no firsthand information about, and so I, I don't speak of it, but other people do. Um, I just feel like what I can do for the world is talk from firsthand experience. And then I um, I think that is the best way I can help other people because I'm speaking from what I know for a fact, uh, from firsthand fact. Oh, look at this. Um, and Mrs., but I'm not even gonna try to pronounce your name. Um, Mary, you are such a beautiful soul. You and your partner are precious. I wanted to ask, how did you find the power to forgive your parents? It was a cult member and still can't let go of the anger. Thank you for uh, coming on that. And um, yes, I um, my husband is in my documentary. He didn't really want to be in it, but he's um, shy and all. But uh, I mean, this he's not. Uh, his personality is very different than mine. And I so I really appreciate him being in it. And yeah, he's a very good part of my life. Um, I do not think that you have to forgive. I, I know other people think that you do, but I don't think you have to forgive. Um, I, um, I don't know that, I mean, some people who watch my film and say I forgave my father, but I think it's more that I came to a point of acceptance, but I never would have done that if I hadn't been angry for a long time. And I think sometimes people are uncomfortable with our anger and they want to shut us down. And um, it's really between you and maybe a trusted friend or a counselor, whether the anger is, is helpful or not helpful. Um, I just, I, you may, Let's see, Stacy, who is Eleanor's daughter, Eleanor is the one who says that much to do about nothing, tell abuse is no big deal. Um, she says uh, in my upcoming documentary, um, Mother's Molestation, I have another interview of her and also um, Eleanor's granddaughter is in that interview. So I interview uh, three generations and um, Eleanor's granddaughter has never been abused. So the cycle can't break, but Stacy is a survivor of abuse. and. Uh, she says, I, I'm, I have not forgiven my mother and I never plan to, um, you know, she never, apologized. she, she, so that's her stance. You don't need to forgive. Um, Lynn Crook, I think would also say, no, you don't need to forgive. Um, it helped for me to come to a point of acceptance so that now with my father, when I think of my father, I don't get angry. I don't get sad. I don't miss him. I just don't have much emotion for him. I consider God my only father. And again, if people are new, I'm not saying that other people need to believe in God. That's just my belief. And uh, my belief is in a very um, kind and loving, compassionate God. And that's who I consider to be my um, father. Um, so I don't have much emotion toward my father. Did your dad's parents and your mom's parents practice SRA? Have you witnessed other kids being murdered I have witnessed murder. Um, I have uh, I on my website, and um, the moderator could 
please put my, up my website again. I have um, an essay on that entitled, My Parents Were KKK Members and Pedophiles. And it tells about a murder um, of a child. And, um, and yeah, it, 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 it's uh, a hard article to read, be essay to read, be careful with yourself when you read it, but it, it is up under the essays tab. I have two essays and, and that's one. And, um, and it's gonna be in my upcoming memoir um, that help will be out in the next six months or so, um, which my, my memoir is a collection of essays. Um, but anyway, I have each of them labeled according to trigger warnings, and that has the most extreme trigger warnings. So be careful as you read it, if you do read it. Um, and I have witnessed um, uh, a child, um, I believe I witnessed a sibling being murdered, um, not a sibling that there was any birth records on. We lived out in the country, and I think they hid a pregnancy. And, um, I tell about that in an essay that's going to be my memoir, um, in Ed, which is also extremely triggering. And it's um, I give examples of ritualistic abuse, and it's in that essay. And then I also give examples of um, familial sex trafficking. And um, I tell about my view of uh, my definitions of familial sex trafficking and the fact that I think many survivors of familial sex trafficking are um, rich, were uh, are survivors of also of ritual abuse. Um, I don't know the percentages, but it, it's not a low percentage. Um, Pia says anger helps accepting help, anger helps. Accepting is my experience. Also the brave women that speak out. Oh, cool. My parents, Christina, my parents had a complete double standard in how they treated my brother. Um, there may have been more to that question. Oh, did my dad's parents? Um, I don't know. It was it was on my father's side of the family that it was ritualistic um, and you know possibly satanic. Um, I mean, my my cousins who describe it as satanic ritual abuse. Um, and on my mom's side of the family, I don't know, um, it was generational. It was, well, there were things that seemed ritualistic. Um, I was taken to the Veterans of Foreign War meeting. Uh, well, I don't know if it was a meeting or if it was men that age, which my grandfather's age, most of them were in the war were in um, World War II, would have been my grandfather. And so a lot of people were, a lot of the men were eligible to go to Veterans of Foreign War meetings. I don't know if it was an actual meeting, but I know what happened to me. And it was, um, it was um, me and other little girls being raped and being gang raped, but, um, there are ways in which you could say it was ritualistic. Um, and that was, this is the grandfather who died when I was six. So um, yeah, I, he didn't go to church. So it was the other side of the family that went to church, but his parents were a Church of Christ members. So I, I don't know how much of it was connected with Church of Christ. I don't know how much connected with KKK. I, um, he was, my mom's side of the family was very uh, open about being racist. My dad's side of the family wasn't, but, um, but I, that's this, I, yeah, I think there may have been KKK on both sides of the family, but I, I think my father's side of the family, there was KKK. Um, okay. Go to something a little, um, Thank you for all the good comments. Oh, so yeah, the moderator is putting the contact information, but I'll just say out loud, my email is marynighthappy at yahoo.com. My last name has a K in it, K-N-I-G-H-T. 
My um, So it's Mary Knight Happy at yahoo.com, spelled K-N-I-G-H-T. And my website is marynightproductions.com. Um, and yeah, let's see, are we? Oh, what, um, Karen, what if you remember abuse capes rituals performed as incantations or in language of Greek or Latin, but no memories of torture or killing or blood. There's not always, um, I, I've known ritual abuse survivors who did not experience torture, killing, or blood. So I, I think um, uh, my def my own definition of ritual abuse is, um, is, would be, Multiple word prayers and it doesn't nest. I don't. I think with my definition, it would be sexual abuse of um, multiple children, or with, uh, with uh, sexual abuse with multiple per adult perpetrators or multiple children. And so I, I you know, it, it's it's what I don't think the term matters as much, but you need to connect with people who have similar experiences and um and um i'm finding i'm in a private facebook group for familial sex trafficking and there's a lot of ritual abuse survivors in it um i'm finding various ways um to connect with people and connecting with people is very important monique do you have any brain issues like executive functioning issues left over from repeated trauma? Does it show up in your life today managing tasks? You know, I, I don't, and I don't know why. I just, in ways, I feel like my recovery has been easier for other than other survivors, and I don't know why that is. I, um, well, you know, I would attribute that to God, but... But then that's then why do other people not have that same? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think that um, I think I came from a very intelligent family, and I think that helps me with with um, is one of the things that helps me mitigate the the trauma the trauma responses. Um, but that you know, I know very intelligent people who have much more trouble than I do. Um, I. The problems, I will say, because I'm basically saying, no, I don't really see it with executive functioning. Um, but the problems I still have are sleep. <laughs> my my husband and I, I love my husband so much, but we slept in separate beds last night because I, I had an intense massage yesterday, and I just was afraid I would. He doesn't like for me. He likes for me to decide. You know, he doesn't like for me. He likes if we're going to start out sleeping in the same bed, stay sleeping in the same bed, and I just wasn't sure I could. Um, and that's something I really want to get over. Um, and um, although there are couples our age that sleep in separate beds because snoring gets worse as you get older, so I don't know that that's so atypical, but um, I have nightmares. <laughs> One time I bit my husband at night. <laughs> I was asleep, but but uh, I bit his arm. <laughs> so anyway, um, he's he's been very patient with me. Um, and so that's a that's a problem I still have. Also, I'm um, I'm I, that my addiction to pleasing people and to giving advice, unsolicited advice, is is still there, and that's something I have to watch in my life. But the other thing I want to say is, I really do have a good life now. I never would have thought, at age forty, that I would ever have the kind of life I have now. I just, I um, one of my problems was I was drawn to men who were, um, well, verbally abusive, I guess. Um, and just um, selfish, and so now I have a husband who's who's really wonderful. And I knew when I I knew that he wasn't like the other men, and uh, that I had dated. And I knew I needed to really pay attention to, you know, if I was like, oh, he's not the right person because I don't like the shirts he wears or something. You know, I needed to not let myself 
um, disregard this relationship for some tiny reason. And, um, and I'm, I'm really glad I did that, but I was aware, like, this is the sort of person I need to be with. And, um, so yeah. Um, oh, um, birth is a giant grave. Oh, interesting name, but, uh, searched random online broadcasting and ended up here. I'm glad you're here. And, oh, we love him for you. You mean my husband. I'll tell him. He gets such good comments and he keeps going, I don't see why you needed me in your film, but yes. What's SRA? And again, I'll say my definition. It's satanic ritual abuse. And um, again, I'll say my definition is that it involves multiple perpetrators and or multiple child victims. Yeah, I, I do have a wonderful husband who's accepting and loving. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I love people talking about my husband. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, he's he's great. Um, we just had a foster child uh, for two weeks. Well, we are, we're respite foster parents. And, um, and so um, this child... Um, Respite means we just keep the children for a weekend to give their full-time foster parent a break. So this little boy uh, went back to his biological mom, which is, you know, what foster care, the, the goal of foster care is to reunite the family. And it worked for him to go back. And um, when he got back, he told the foster mom, I still want to do respite. And she had no idea what that meant. But when she found out about this and when she found out that um, her social worker would like for him to still come to us. Um, then she said, yeah, you know, so we kept him weekends and then she moved out of state. And now we fly him in to see us once a year. So my husband who spent two weeks with this 13 year old, just like the, the, the young man, just um, some problems he has some, he's just not good at making friends. So he considers my husband his friend and they've just been off seeing tide pools and going, going, um, walking down to the lake and just doing all kinds of things during this time. But um, I don't know if we want two weeks next, we did one week last year and this week, two weeks, that two weeks might be a little long. Um, but he leaves, the little boy leaves on Saturday. Um, but yeah, my husband's been great. Someone asked satanic. Um, so I've talked about satanic, like I don't believe in Satan anymore. And I know some of you really believe in Satan and that, that that's a way to conceptualize how, why someone would do this. And it does seem, you know, when I did believe in Satan, I did attribute Satan to having um, powers. But now I think that each person can choose to be evil or can choose to be good. So, um, yeah, that's my comment on Satan. Um, but um, I have no problem with being identified as a satanic ritual abuse survivor, even though I no longer believe in Satan. And I very much disagree with, I mean, satanic ritual abuse happens. It, it happens, it continues to happen. Um, and I know young survivors of it. Some people say, well, it just happened a long time ago. That's not true. Um, I was at a conference. My husband at first was like, well, maybe it's not something that just happened a long time ago. And I was at a conference and I talked to a survivor who looked young and I said, do you know, do you mind if I ask you how old you are? And she's 19. I mean, this, it just keeps happening. Um, oh, someone, Don adopted twin foster boys that's so cool um and yeah that's great um so many more um foster homes are needed is it easier to identify as sra than an incest survivor no i i think um i i think incest survivors are more readily believed and um i of course, I've always said that it was my parents, so I've never, um, you know, not disclosed that part. I, I think I have heard of people who disclose abuse by non-relatives and not by their parents. But for me, um, I, I couldn't 
I couldn't talk about satanic ritual abuse without talking about my parents being abusers because they, they are, they were there most of the time and they, my parents were and, um, or they very much gave me over to my grandparents or, um, or, or they trafficked me. I used to not know what I didn't identify as a sex trafficking survivor until I finished my film and I was looking for a fiscal sponsor and someone told me about Shared Hope International and that it was for um, human trafficking survivors. And I said, well, I don't think I am a human trafficking survivor. And they said, well, but you talked about child pornography. And child pornography is, by definition, human trafficking. I mean, someone is, if, if it's sold, someone is is making money off the, um, off the uh, victimization of children. So... Um, so that's when I started identifying. I mean, it took that long, but a lot of familial sex trafficking survivors don't identify as such because they think it doesn't count because it, like I did, I thought it didn't count. I thought it didn't count because my parents did it, but I knew I'd been sold to people. So now I identify, um, it's easier to identify as familial sex trafficking because everyone knows it's, everyone knows that children are sex trafficked. Um, I don't know if I answered that. I, I tried to answer that question about, for me, it's, for me, sometimes it's different. You know, the, the incest is as hard to deal with as a ritual abuse. I mean, I remember my aunt asked me and my cousin, which was harder to deal with incest or, or um, satanic ritual abuse. And we both said, well, it depends on which one you're dealing with at the time. If you're, you're dealing with some new memories of incest. That's the hardest. If you're dealing with some new memories of satanic ritual abuse, that's the hardest. It's um, they're both just as hard as it can be. And the other thing I want to say, because some survivors on this call are not SRA survivors, but you're incest survivors, and I just want to say, it's not how bizarre the abuse is, how much it affects you. Each person is different. It's like saying I love chocolate ice cream more than you love chocolate ice cream. How can you know you can't compare those two? And so, um, because it's internal. And I think that's a way you can't compare how bad your abuse is to someone else's because it's how you affect, have been affected internally. So I just want to say like one of my friends was, she's had to deal with chronic pain her whole life. And it's from a one time incest by her brother who was just like two or three years older than her. I mean, it was a one time and it wasn't, not only was it not torture, it was not physically um, painful um, and did not include it, of course. And I mean, from every definition, it was much more minor than mine. And yet she's still dealing um, I think she's dealing with more chronic pain than I am. And I used to deal with a lot of chronic pain. Okay, uh, new question. My mother introduced me into SRA and trafficked me later. People believe the trafficking, but don't want to talk about SRA. And I wonder why. Yeah, yeah, I think it's what the media has done to SRA or you know how, I mean, we are now in a time when people are wanting to help human trafficking survivors and um, yeah, I'm glad I've gone public about both, but I, I do know people who don't go public about SRA. One was a minister to me. It was so sad because she's a minister and she thought, she thought her, her church could, ex could handle hearing about the incest. So she told him that. And then she had just started telling him something about the, um, human trafficking, about the sex trafficking. But she didn't think they could ever handle that SRA. And I just, oh, that's so sad because churches are supposed to accept and love and all that. Oh, someone wants, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, I hope I've answered that. Um, if I haven't answered your question, feel free to post it again. Someone, um, Don has chronic pain. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, abuse and chronic pain. I mean, it is not always, not everyone who has chronic pain was abused, but so many, it's so prevalent. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I, I don't, Christina made a comment and I, I don't know anything about that. So I don't have anything to add about 
uh, this nonprofit. Um, oh, I sent your, Don says, I sent your video to my mother yesterday, and I pray she will watch it and it can open a conversation. Thank you for your help for us. Oh, thank you. And yeah, I, I, uh, we have 15 minutes left, by the way. Something just flashed across screen and I, I didn't get a chance to read it. Um, maybe it's up here. Uh, the Body Keeps the Score. Oh, yes. Um, the book, The Body Keeps the Score by um, Vander Koch. I highly recommend. It has been on the science bestseller list since it came out. And it came out in, I don't know, 2016. Um, and I, I think it's very worth buying or you should be able to get it at a library. It's a very popular book. Um, and yeah, again, I don't know about the person you mentioned, uh, Christina. Um, oh yeah, Christina also says that she was hospitalized to discredit, to be discredited. Yeah, I think so. Um, there are so many different ways they tried to discredit us, which is very sad. Well, we have uh, we have um, just a little over ten minutes. Any, uh, I like to end on something happy, and so unless there's some other questions, I'm going to talk about because I was asked how did I recover, and I'm going to talk about that. I, I think that's a good way to end. Um, so many different things I did. Oh. Have you had anyone speak of the problems with getting counseling when you are low income? Oh, it's so hard to get counseling. It's hard. I went to three different counselors once I moved. I live in Bellingham, Washington, and I went to three counselors here who could not handle my life experiences. And I mean, they were, it was bizarre the things I went through. Um, and finally, I called my, um, insurance because I was trying to go to someone with my Kaiser insurance and I called Kaiser and said I told him all my experiences and and said you have to let me go to someone else and they did and so um, I went to a, a sex therapist for a while and um, not not for sex therapy but just I knew with her credentials she um, I thought that she would be able to handle what I had to say and I was right she was um, but it's so hard to find a counselor, whether you're low income, whether you have insurance, it's just so hard to find a counselor. I wish I had some ideas on that. Um, I will say um, I can give some, uh, for low income people, um, some things that, like, I think you can get coaching through Elevate. Elevate is a, a nonprofit uh, by Rebecca Binder. Um, and, um, she does a lot of, she does classes. She is a Christian herself, but um, her classes are open and you know people of all religions and non-religions are accepted by her. Um, and so that's something to look up. Um, I wish I knew more about how to help people who, who don't have insurance. I don't even know. It's even hard if you have insurance. Do you find that talking publicly about your experience is therapeutic? Um, yes. Um, and then can it sometimes be too much? Yes. My husband was you know, like, he's gotten used to like the day after I do something that it's, um, you know, that I might have a hard day. It's gotten less so. I'm feeling really good right now. So I'm feeling comfortable right now. I think I'll be fine later today. Um, but um, uh I, I think all of life is therapeutic and I kind of like when people say, was your film therapeutic? And when counselors ask that, especially I say, you know, I want to say doing social work was extremely therapeutic. Um, you know, many things in life are therapeutic. And I think um, when I think, I think that's okay. I think, you know, helping other people is therapeutic. Um, but yeah, the thing that, this Am I Crazy film, I just don't ever question my memories anymore. I never question them. I know they're true. I mean, I sat across from people who asked me any question they wanted, and they didn't ask any questions I hadn't 
no questions I hadn't already asked myself. So yeah, that was therapeutic and I came to terms with my father. I mean, it's really nice to be able to not think about my father very much. I just really don't think about him much. I was on a, I'm in a private Facebook group that uh, someone was like, is Father's Day hard for you? And I, I'd, I'd, I'd actually forgotten about Father's Day. Uh, you know, that was my first reminder that today, that Sunday was Father's Day. And, but also, um, on Father's Day, I have a tradition to call each of my sons and tell them, you know, I'm happy Father's Day. I'm proud of you. And I just think you're really a good father. And so that's what I do on Father's Day. I, I, I don't think about my father. Um, I, I just, yeah, God's my father and God's a good father to me. Do you think that SRA affected your behavior? You seem so calm and peaceful. Um, yeah, I, I do seem calm. I haven't always seemed that way, but it's been, I'm 67 years old. So I'm, you know, I'm an old lady and um, I worked really hard to get to where I'm at now. And one thing I do, what I tell people, um, and I have this on my website with how I healed, is think of it as your part-time job. And that's how I had to do it because some days it seemed like all I did was things to help me heal. And, and, and then I'd feel like at night, I'd feel like, oh, I didn't get anything done today. And so I started thinking of this is my part-time job and eventually I'll be well. And uh, this was after my divorce and I didn't know how I would um, support myself. And I got um, spousal support for five years and um, but I just knew I need to work on getting well because I can never support myself unless I get more well. So, um, and I, I think whether you heal more in your body, you heal more in your mind. I mean, like going on walks is really helpful for me. I'm going to go on a walk later today and it's, it's really beautiful, uh, beautiful trails just right out my door. I'm very fortunate. So, um, yeah, uh, healing, um, uh, yeah, I, you know what I hate is when I was first remembering my abuse and someone said, said I should read that, I think it's called The Hiding Place, but it's about uh, someone whose parents hid um, Jews from the Nazis. And they're like, and she forgave everyone. Well, if you actually read the book, you find out that there were many years that she didn't forgive. And then she has a quote at the she has a situation at the end of the book where she met someone who had tortured her sister. And at that point she was able to forgive, but that wasn't right after it was not right after. And so I just, I think everyone goes through their journey and, and um, don't expect too much of yourself. And one of the things I do to help me heal is I read novels, you know, I, I have fun and I quit watching as many um, hard films. And I just let myself be, um, yoga is so helpful to me. I, I spend hours a week. Yes, that's right, Tina, it's the hiding place. But you know, you read that whole book and she did not, she eventually forgave, but she didn't initially forgive. And someone, I was taking singing lessons from someone um, which was helping me as a part of my healing. And um, his wife, it was an older couple and his wife said, well, couldn't you just do this like her? And I'm like, did she really do that? So I read the book and it wasn't true at all. I mean, I think the person who said that to me was trying to protect herself from my grief. And that's not a good way to do it. Um, and um, you just need to accept people where they are. Horses, yeah, horses, um, PS, yeah, they, they can be really therapeutic. Therapeutic art. Oh, yeah. I, I love art. Um, oh, uh, Christina, the gymnastics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I won't get into that because I'm trying on the healing stuff. But um, uh, I'm talking about healing. But, yes, that, that was horrible what happened to the gymnast. Well, we have less than five minutes. Yes, so I just think recovery is possible. You keep working at it and you will recover. And I just want that message to really come through to you because 
that helped me during the days when, I mean, I my spousal support was going to run out. I didn't know how I would support myself. And I just, the, the focusing on the recovery helped. Um, and the hope of believing that I would recover. So that's what I want to do for you today is make you hopeful that you can recover, make you hopeful that your friends will recover and um, and and have a happy life because I truly do have a happy life now. I um, have children in my life just as much as I want to have children with the foster care and also I volunteer at my, grand, at my grandson's school. And um, I, um, you know, there's just so much beauty and peace in my life. So um, as much as you can, and today after listening to this, you really need to be careful with yourself. And when I'm in a group of people that everyone can answer, I ask them, think of something you can do today to take care of yourself. Because being in on this Q&A was hard. And remind yourself of that and think of one. If you could just take a minute right now, think of one thing and put it in the chat if you want. One thing you'll do today to take care of yourself. So yeah, if you can think of something that you'll do today to take care of yourself, I just really encourage you to think of something you'll do today to take care of yourself. I'm gonna read more of my novel um, and uh, I'm going to um, go on a walk and um, uh, I'm, yeah, you know, I guess those are what come to mind. I'm gonna fix myself a really, um, a lunch I really like. So those are three things. So I hope you can think of some things that that um, will help you. And Wendy, I didn't get a chance to comment on yours, but feel free to email me if you like. Um, yeah, I'm, um, oh, this is cute. Um, Earth is a giant grave. Lion's strength is known by their by their scars. Oh, thank you, Wendy, for your comment. Thank you, P.S. Thank you, all of you, for your wonderful comments. Um, we had talked, I talked to the moderator about what to do if we had uh, difficult comments, but um, we didn't have any. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I just so much appreciate it. Um, I'll just say again, um, focus on recovery, know it's hard work, but know it will pay off and have some fun today. Take care of yourself today. I've really, this has been a great meeting and we'll do this again, by the way, we're going to do some more Q and A's. We have less than a minute. Oh, thank you. Uh, the thank yous and the hearts. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Take care of yourself today, really. I really mean that. I really want you to take care of yourself today. Find support. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, the abuse is real. It is. Yes. We're not crazy. The people who say we're crazy are, are the ones living in a different reality. We're we're in we're in truth. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you all. What wonderful comments. Yes, we plan to broadcast again. Well, bye. Thank you, Don. Yeah, thank you, Pam.